Trans people competing in sports has always been a controversial conversation that everyone feels compelled to speak on. Over the years, opinions from important people in power have been prized over actual doctors and actual trans people in sports speaking from their personal experience. One such comment made by the Australian Olympic Committee's president, Ian Chesterman, is the topic of our video today, so let's get into it. First up, let's talk about trans women in sports. Not a lot of people in sports have been discriminated against in sports as much as trans athletes, especially women who identify with the transgender community. To this day, identity is an apparent and huge part of how an individual can compete in sports. In fact, some are even prohibited to play sports solely because of how they may identify, which seems like a prehistoric practice. Most recently, a long list of elite sought after sports like swimming, water polo, diving, and the likes was affected by new rules outlined by FINA, the swimming world's governing body. These rules put in place policies that would bar transgender women from all elite competitions if they have, in any way, experienced any part of male puberty. This was a seismic decision, which is not very common for Olympic sports, and was decided by 71% of the vote of 152 national federations at the Olympic World Championships. The decision was supposedly based on a scientific report by FINA itself that claimed that trans women retained a significant advantage over cisgender female swimmers, even after reducing their testosterone levels through medication. This policy is the most extensive ban on trans people's participation in sports to this date. Now, let's talk about the general reaction to the new policy. So, here's the thing. Many trans athletes strongly believe that the new policy by FINA is not based on science, facts, or human rights to the extent they seem to be making it out to be. In fact, the new rule will deeply harm all women in sport, and it's believed that the ruling is poorly designed and lacks adequate scientific backing. A Guardian article also mentioned how convenient it seems that when sports organizations seek to ban transgender people from participation, they can easily find experts to support their position while ignoring the realities that exist in participation. The belief that policies on trans inclusion need to be this confusing is a new phenomenon since they've existed fairly simply at the highest level of sports with no issues for decades. So the issue with the policy. FINA's new policy requires athletes to have transitioned before the onset of puberty, and it's very easy to see the flaws in that logic with just a bit of critical thinking ability. Let's not forget that in many US states and countries all over the world, access to gender-affirming care is almost never accessible to young people. Or, if it is, it's very controlled and limited. More than that, though, it's a lack of acknowledgement to the fact that not everyone is privileged enough to have access to supportive families if they do come out young who will help them get access to hormones and gender-affirming care. Healthcare systems can sometimes be deeply discriminatory, and some trans people don't come out until well after their puberty, be it because of the conventionally binary and cis-favoring world we live in or something else. Figuring out one's gender identity at such a young age can be challenging for some. But does it actually help protect women. Another issue regarding the general helpfulness of this policy also arose, because the policy does not technically help protect any cisgender women in these elite sports. In fact, FINA's new eligibility criteria will even mandate invasive testing to decide who they deem to be women enough and whom they don't. This might also allow any female in the sport to be randomly targeted or tested. A part of that is because the policy allows for violations of privacy and bodily autonomy for all women, and practices such as these have been called out by multiple human rights organizations, namely Human Rights Watch and the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner. Many people believe that these policies are just a way to cater to those in power who can't accept identities outside the binary and conventional, and claim that misinformation is being used in the policy as a core element of attack on fairness and safety. Now, what does this have to do with AOC? Back to the topic at hand, let's talk about why Australian Olympic Committee has been in the news lately in association with the new policy set by FINA. Among all these new policies, AOC and President Ian Chesterman seemed to be content with following the global Olympic body's head. Chesterman claimed that the thing they constantly need to focus on is the fact that sports needs to be inclusive. Except that's definitely not what the new policy stands for. Chesterman also believed that they're responsible for creating new opportunities for every young Australian, and particularly if they come from a group heavily marginalized. He believed that they need to be encouraging and helping them to use the sport as part of their development and growth. In a fairly diplomatic matter, the president of AOC claimed that there comes a point in time when people move through being involved in a sport to the point in elite competition where there's a need to have a fair enough competition. And he said that it's up to each specific sport to decide how they choose to achieve that balance. To him, the IOC, or the International Olympic Committee, is taking the lead on this, rather than a National Olympic Committee. So they've set out a framework which says that respect must be part of the framework. And so should inclusion and fairness. To him, one needs to balance all those things as they move through the pathway of sport, from someone who's just starting out to someone who's at an Olympic 
Olympic or Paralympic Games level. He's not the only one from AOC who has had a lot to say, though. The chief executive of AOC, Mark Harrell, also joined in on the conversation and talked about how the Australian body's overarching policy would be to follow the iOS's framework. He said that it couldn't be a one-policy-fits-all type thing due to the difference in each sport, both on a macro and micro level. Both Chesterman and Carroll, however, openly claim that Australia's Olympic movement remains a welcoming and inclusive place for transgender women. They also stressed the importance of keeping the conversation about this topic respectful. Carroll claimed that everyone was welcome in the sport, and that there are 46 sports, everyone can find their place in an Olympic sport without a doubt, and that they'd be most welcome. And now, in other related news, let's talk about that decision's impact. Many people think that the swimming committee's ultimately discriminatory decision will end up affecting transgender women in elite sports and regular sports everywhere. Swimming may be the first sport to adopt such a decisive and tough edict, and it may spark a chain reaction in other sports. And maybe it already has. The International Rugby League has already effectively excluded all transgender athletes from sanctioned international matches, including this year's Rugby League Women's World Cup in England. And that's definitely one extreme direction to go in. And now, other major sports committees are revising, or looking into revising their policies on inclusivity. This includes FIFA World Athletics and even the World Netball Federation. Last year, the IOC revised its guidelines on inclusion, with a new framework advising that no athlete should be excluded from competition on the grounds of perceived unfair advantage. However, it has left the actual creating and enacting of the rules to respective federations. Next up, maybe some sports aren't as accommodating to the new policy. Maybe, maybe things aren't as bleak as they seem for transgender athletes, even if they're definitely not alright. It seems like while some high-profile sports, such as swimming and rugby, have enacted blanket bans, other sports in the world may be moving in an opposite and preferable direction. Just this Friday, Germany's Football Federation announced that transgender, intersex, and non-binary athletes at youth, futsal, and amateur level would be able to decide for themselves in which competitions they participate. Finally, what did the DFB say? The DFB said that the policy applies to all transgender players who can now switch at a self-determined time or remain initially in the team in which they'd been playing previously. According to their experience, this does not affect or sabotage the integrity of the competition. After all, all people have different physical strengths and abilities that only lead to success together in a team, regardless of gender, is the belief they seem to abide by. And that's all for this video. What do you think of Ian Chesterman's comments on behalf of the AOC in relation to the new final policy? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed watching the video, be sure to leave a like and share the video. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications by pressing the bell icon to get notified every time we post a new video. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.